I'm here most of the time. Ah, uh, yourself. Look, if you could get a four-day week, would you take it? Yeah, all right. Now, I must, I must point out, our show, as I understand, starts late again tonight. And you know why? Because we've been preempted the past several months because the primaries that are going on in all the states, even though it's almost a closed issue already, NBC interrupts the show for anything political. Last week we came on late because uh, an NBC had an election special called Leonard Nimoy Goes in Search of a Bob Dole Delegate. <laughs> and we came on a half hour late. We, uh, have been watching all the television the past two weeks. You probably have noticed all the specials that are on. The Indy 500 was one of them. This was not a quiz. No, the reason they have... The reason they have all the specials and movies of the week, even the local news here in Los Angeles was doing a thing on teenage sexuality, like this, they've just discovered that teenagers are sexual. The reason they are doing that, because we are in what they call ratings weeks in television, and all the ratings on all the shows are based on what people watch this year. And, for example, the networks... NBC has a thing on called Moviola. Have you seen that? Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> kind of uh, NBC's, I guess, history as they see Hollywood in the past. I wouldn't miss part four tonight. This stars... This episode stars Regis Philbin and Cindy Garvey as Tracy and Hepburn. <laughs> so, uh, now, last night, they had... Uh, on Moviola, they had the, um, the battle for the role of Scarlett O'Hara... In Gone with the Wind. Did any of you see that? Okay. And NBC recreated the plantation Terra. And um, they were trying to save a buck, it was obvious. Because if you look closely, it wasn't really Terra. All they did was put two columns in front of Jim Rockford's trailer. <laughs> and you knew that it wasn't Terra because you could see the ocean in the background. But uh, <laughs> movie all is starting to run out of classic movie stories of the past. Personally, I cannot get too excited about the tragic love affair between Marjorie Main and Gabby Hayes. <laughs> you didn't know about that, huh? Oh, yeah. Gabby said, I'm in love with Hoppy. <laughs> you like that, don't you? You believe what's happening in the past two or three days in this world? I'm gone one day, and things are falling apart. Nothing but disasters in the news. Riots down in Miami. They have riots in Korea. Volcano erupts in Washington. Tomorrow show's going to 90 minutes. There's nothing but... It is incredible. All of these disasters, strangely enough, have been a boost in the television ratings. Do you get the feeling that God knows it's sweep month? I, I don't get that feeling at all. I thought maybe you did did you know that they have a cloud of ash going from Mount St. Helens all the way so far past Kansas and Nebraska, and they think it may go all the way to the East Coast because of that eruption and may uh, have something to do with the weather for years in this country? Remember Krakatoa? When, when, did, when did Krakatoa blow up? Thursday. Thursday? Thursday. What do you mean? <laughs> Thursday. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't that have been on the news, Fred? Where, where, how, where was Krakatoa? Was that in Java? East, East of Java. Java. And it blew up, what, in the 18... Right around then. <laughs> who cares? Well, I'm trying to make a point here. What do you mean, who cares? Well, well, is it important to the joke? Yes. That is 1896. No, it's, you know, it's not 1896. Anyway, years after that, they had beautiful sunsets in the country, and the weather was affected for years and years. But it turns out today, American industry is very angry with that volcanic ash blowing across the country because they don't want people breathing in pollution that isn't man-made. <laughs> so, you're right, the date had absolutely nothing to do with that joke. <laughs> ah, let's see. Did any of you take the NBC tour today? They have a tour. <laughs> you are part of what they get to see on the tour. Um, what do they show you on that, anyway? Did you know that yeah, nothing... <laughs> Did you know a lot of the tour guides will become future NBC executives? <laughs> sure. And a lot of the tour guides are past NBC executives. <laughs> Some of the things they're showing on the tour this week, you can go in and watch the algae form on the Big Show swimming pool. <laughs> Is, uh... <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> and uh, they also, they'll take you into uh, consumer advocate David Horowitz's dressing room and he tests Twinkies on a Canadian rat. They will show you that. <laughs> And then one of the things they have in the tour, they will, um, Quincy is over in the NBC commissary, uh, dissecting the meatloaf to try to determine the exact moment the horse died. <laughs> What's going on politically? It's not uh, how much of a race anymore. Did you read that they say John Anderson's candidacy may throw the election into the House of Representatives? That would be something. I think that's part of Anderson's strategy. Then his aides dress up as Arabs and they're going to pass out bribes. <laughs> that's his strategy. Now, it wouldn't have been mine. I predict Anderson's going to take a lot of votes away from Ronald Reagan. No, and I'll tell you why. See, Anderson gives the Republicans a real alternative. A young man with old hair. Anyway, we have uh, an exciting show. You probably didn't announce our surprise guest. Spiro Agnew was going to come out here and start a pyramid club. Small change Carson here. <laughs> I know it's not fair to you people at home, but you'll just have to come here and find out what happened. <laughs> It'd be fun one night to broadcast the show that goes on during the commercials. Uh, wouldn't it? Though? Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> yes, and just leave this out entirely. <laughs> Got some, got some good news tonight. What? I found out the past few days. What? You didn't know? Oh, I know, yes. About our orchestra leader? No, Mr. Severinsen was married. On Saturday. On Saturday. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and this time, I went in the bathroom and cried. <laughs> Never threw anything away. <laughs> She's pretty good. Emily's a lovely girl. Yes, she, she is. really is. Thank you. Congratulations, Doctor. Thank you very much. Be happy. Be happy. Be happy. And be tolerant. Be tolerant. Be tolerant. Be, be understanding. Compassionate. Be loving. Be forgiving. Be gentle. Be tender. Yes. And be, be ready. Kind. And be ready to pay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't. This is start. the final one. This is this it. This is it. This is it. What? Eight. Eight. Eight what? Eight. No, no, me. No, no. No, not me. Oh, you mean between? Oh, well, we don't yeah, well, about that. <laughs> this show has not exactly no. been a training ground yeah. for marital bliss, no. has it? I could easily make two bridge tables. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Okay, anyway. <laughs> you know what? It's going into a cycle again. Trivia books. Yes. There's the book of lists. There's the shows like that's incredible. The Guinness Book of Records. All this stuff is coming around again. Right. Believe it or not, people are fascinated with, with nothing, I guess. That's why television is so popular. <laughs> if they ever catch on to that, we're out of business, you know that. This is called the Mammoth Book of Trivia. This is, a, this is a big book of trivia by a gentleman by the name of, uh, might as well give him credit, right? By James Myers. And it's just filled with all kinds of fascinating information that you can use at cocktail parties. Do you know where the term, now we've taken some of them out, do you know where the term lynch you know, mm -hmm. designated to use the unlawful execution or hanging of somebody by mob action comes from? Was it from a man's name? You're absolutely right. Did you take a guess or did you I keep? just guessed. Yeah. Meryl. What? What? Meryl. No, no, not no. Meryl Lynch. <laughs> I have him sit over with short <laughs> No. Nowadays, a lot of people would like to do it to Meryl Lynch, but... Uh, Captain William Lynch, who died in 1820, organized a vigilance committee in P Pennsylvania, Pits <laughs> Pennsylvania County, Virginia. Lynch's method of dealing with thugs was to give the expression Lynch's law. And they went out and just strung them up. Now, do you know what those white blobs you see when you close your eyes are? Do you ever get that little mm -hmm. white spots? And do you think there's something wrong? Those are called phosphines. Phosphines? Mm -hmm. 
Those are visual images produced when the retina is stimulated by pressure exerted on the eyeball from the closure of your eyelids. Mm. There's nothing wrong. Yeah. Sometimes you'll see all those strange things yeah. when you close yeah. your eyes. Mm. Sometimes you see much more interesting things when your eyes are closed than you do when your eyes That's are open. That's right. Did you know in her lifetime, this one you can drop at a party, one termite queen can produce over 500 million children? Wow. Stretch marks have to be incredible. <laughs> The last 100 million, I think, are by cesarean. That's probably, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the body of the average adult contains 2,800 square inches of skin, making the skin the largest single organ. The skin is an organ in right. the human body. Most people would say the biggest organ is the brain. Mm. It's skin. Did you know that? I did. You know, know it now, yes. I know it before. Before when? Before now. Ah. Or just then. <laughs> Did you know that traffic jams are not a 20th century phenomenon? Street traffic was so thick in ancient Rome that Julius Caesar forbid almost all wheeled vehicles to use the streets during the daytime. Well, you didn't know that. I did didn't you? know that. Yeah, no, no, smart I never guy. Didn't know that. I didn't have the book. A <laughs> Kentucky law. Uh, a Kentucky law still on the books makes it illegal for a married man to buy a hat unless his wife is along to assist in the selection. <laughs> oh, very, very strict in Kentucky. Strange. I think you can be lynched in Kentucky yeah. for that, actually. Chocolate contains drugs. In addition to caffeine, chocolate contains theobromine, a mild stimulant. No, I didn't know that. Do you know what the most widely used medical drug today in the world is? Aspirin. Americans swallow about 22 billion tablets each year. Mm. About 100 pills annual for each person. You don't take 100 no, aspirin a year, I do don't. you? Here's an interesting one, Doc. In the days of the Wild West, divorce papers were dispensed by slot machine. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I singling out Doc for this? Why? In the early 1870s, a law firm in Corrine, Utah, was so swamped with divorce cases, they had a machine constructed to issue the documents at $2.50 per set. Utah was on a territory requiring no grounds for divorce. And the only thing that people had to do was just sign it and put it in a machine. Two dollars and fifty cents? Two fifty. Yeah. Inflation has gone up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, those are some facts from trivia. Well, that's a, that's a great name for that book, Mammoth, because, you know, they could have right. called that all-encompassing or the complete compendium. Could have. They didn't. Mammoth says it, boy. They just call it Mammoth. That's a wonderful about a word like that. In one word, how you can get the complete idea of the story. Are you going to get to this? I'll get to this, yeah. yes. Because that certainly... That book certainly contains everything in the world you would want to know about trivia. You are wrong, Bowery dumpster breath. <laughs> <laughs> there is yet more. Yeah, we had our more. We had our, our staff. Our staff went out digging. We found trivia that makes this look like nothing. <laughs> Did you know a two-hump camel has more boyfriends than a one-hump camel? <laughs> In 1978, in a laboratory in France, Roman Polanski developed the world's first test tube teeny bopper. <laughs> Not generally known. The producer of the TV show, TV show, Sheriff Lobo, is actually a dummy used in high-speed auto crash tests. <laughs> you see that one? In 11 states, it is legal to eat ice cream while being electrocuted. Some of this is just trivia, sure. unfunny trivia. Yeah. You can become much wiser if you insert owl eyes into your head. <laughs> men with hairy chests make better lovers than men without chests. <laughs> Thomas Edison invented, I didn't know this, Thomas Edison invented the cream-filled cupcake. However, he died before completing the Twinkie. <laughs> America is estimated to have a 250-year reserve of guest hosts. <laughs> Did you know there is no mention in the Dead Sea Scrolls of anyone named Satchmo? <laughs> Here's a good one. It's kind of a war, you know, history type of thing if you're a war buff. The original name for the feared German battleship, the Bismarck, was Kurt and Otto's boat. <laughs> Didn't have a nice ring to it. No. You and him go out. Sink Kurt and Otto's no, boat. No, didn't, didn't scan work. nice. 
The reason homosexuality is so common in prison is because the uniforms look like pajamas. <laughs> A Mr. Mort Hansen wore over 57 different sets of animal ears in an attempt to meet Walt Disney. <laughs> Using... <laughs> Using split-screen techniques, it is possible for both Roy Rogers and Dale Evans to be played by the same actor. Uh, Menopause is more likely to strike at low tide. <laughs> no Colombian fishing trawler outside Miami has ever had a fish in it. <laughs> And one like the smallest Arab city is the tiny hamlet of Zarak. The largest Arab city is Beverly Hills. <laughs> okay, we'll be back with Charles Nelson Riley right after this. And Tom Brokaw is with us tonight. Yes, tonight. I'm sure you all know this gentleman. He is an actor, he's a comedian, and a director who just finished performing in a play called Charlotte. The New York Times, New York Times critic, wrote that his acting was impeccable. That's what it said. Here is the impeccable acting of Charles Nelson Riley. I was correct. I was quoting the New York Times. Yeah, now, that's, uh, I, I, was in a flop, I was in a lot of flop plays. Well, I was going to say, if your acting was impeccable, Charlotte did not last. Uh, how long did Charlotte play? In what time York? is it now? <laughs> <laughs> no, four days, four nights. Oh. But that's okay. No, it's I've been not in... okay. How much time do you put into that now? Oh, you see, you see the, the thing about it is you rehearse the same amount for a flop as you do a hit. And the people that make the costumes, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, the people that make the costumes, I love you. They make the costumes and the sets, you know, same the same thing. If it's a hit or a miss, sure, you know, it's the same that. amount of work, and you rehearse seven weeks. Yes, See, my the, glasses are fogging over. The you know, it's the medication yes. and everything but else. The, There's <laughs> only a few hours left. But the reward. Did he lift his hand up in front of me? Yes. <laughs> the rewards I'm talking about, the rewards are much better if the play runs. Obviously, the backers don't make any money. The investors oh, don't make any money. And, and they would call me up just before we opened on Broadway. I was the leading man, which I'll discuss later. In, in Charlotte? Yeah, before oh. we go on the first commercial, try it up, sure. bring it up to a laugh. Of course. <laughs> the, uh, try, to, try to peak, you know, when you, when you, the right time. That queen termite is under my washing machine. Really? There's nothing under the whole thing here. No, I, 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 see, I'm gone again. See how it happens? Uh, what was I saying? I was telling you about... You were the about... leading man in the play, but you want to tell me something else before that. See how... But, right? See, it's gone. See what happens when they fog over the glasses? If you bring yeah. your cameras yeah. in, you'll see they're fogged yeah. over. They are. We have a lot of what they call early morning fog, but usually burning... I'll get it. It always comes no. back. Right. A leading man on Broadway, uh, it's gone now. See, it's over. They called you. What? The night before you opened. The what? Night they called you. The <laughs> night before you opened on Broadway. And said what? <laughs> Did you want... <laughs> Somebody... I can get a call. Let me check that trivia book. You see how I go? Maybe it's in here. <laughs> Somebody called. Somebody called me. When you say they, when you say they, it may they. What is that? That's a collective noun. They. Oh, oh, they call me. I got it. See how it comes back. The doctor said when it would come. Right. Just when you think it's bad, it comes back. They called you. They called me. Exactly right. what I said. They called me and they said, "How do you want your dressing room? You want the blue wicker, the white wicker, or the gray wicker?" I had a two-room suite. Right. I said, the play, we got to fix the play before we get. You know, that's what they do. They get. Yeah. The, you have a dressing room that's gorgeous. I have a ballet. Now, I mean, these pants are $6. Right. A valet puts them on, you get nervous. So the thing is, it plays the thing, as Shakespeare said. He did it's, say that. He said it. It's probably in there, too. I know. 
and 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 speak and, the speech I pray thee, trippingly on the tongue. Yes, very good. Thank you. You know, I'm glad you're here for Do three not more mouth years. the words. Yes, it's or a good stuff. I've heard that guilty creature sitting at a play have, by the very cunning of the scene, been struck so so. All that stuff. You all that stuff. Oh, stuff. I'd have to teach you. You got to know all that That's jazz. Right. But anyway, uh, see, I go. I, 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 Wicker, wicker furniture. Gray, wicker. furniture. Wicker. I ordered the gray wicker. Gray I told wicker. you that. No, you didn't. You know, I have a feeling tomorrow, Charles. I'll gonna, be better. I'm going to be all right. Tomorrow they're going to move you out in the sun for a while. No, not that. They didn't say until Saturday. Oh, oh, I can't go until Saturday. Okay, the furniture in the dressing room. Oh, what they do, they make a big thing about the dressing room. You see, right. and the play, the play, the it's play. The thing. And I was the leading man. Now, this is lovely because there's a few directors in the theater and in movies. The producers looking at the clock. Uh, 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 directors in, in the movies and the television who, who know me as a serious actor, which is hard to believe. No, I can understand it. It's hard to believe. But I, I was the leading man in this play, and I was the leading man. I was the master of horses in the palace in eight, the 18th century, mm -hmm. and I had spurs and boots. Now, I never play these parts. I very seldom wear shoes in the parts that I play. Now, when you have you ever played a part with spurs? Once in a motel in Bakersfield. <laughs> what it was, uh... Well, anyway, if you ever do, because you're a wonderful actor. Thank you. If you ever do, you see, you sit like this on the stage. It was a hunting lodge, you see, and I was the leading man. Oh, and you have your spurs on. I had seven children and everything. I was, I was, stud takes on a new meaning. <laughs> Father now, also, seven. I didn't wear my glasses, which counts for the fact that there was no fogging over during the whole performance. You now, go if to you... contacts, then? No, I don't. I can't find my teeth. I'm going to look for contacts. <laughs> I mean, you glue the hair on, you put the teeth in, you... and now you're going to look for your eyes. <laughs> Too short, like. That's right. That's right. So anyway, you're sitting there with the Spurs acting. I wish you and Emily great happiness. I love you. I move right on. <laughs> and he was wonderful in Kansas City. Yes. You're sitting there with the Spurs. Get your darker wicker. You'll find it last. Yeah. Yeah. You're sitting with the Spurs, yeah. and then it comes time to get up. And your legs are cramped a bit. No, not cramped, because I was the leading man. You can't get a cramp if you're the leading man. That's right. Only supporting actors get cramped. <laughs> but the, 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 the Spurs lock together. <laughs> You see? <laughs> While you're busy acting and playing. Well, the suddenly judge. they're together. Now, I'm trying to be the leading man as best I can. <laughs> and then... Then it comes time for me to cross from the sofa to the window to feed the birds. <laughs> right? That's right. well, more like... To show the fact that although you're compelled to horses... Right. ...you still can see a sweet bird. There's a tenderness there. Yes. Right. Along. You saw my performance. <laughs> well, uh... So anyway, then I got up, and then when you get up, you realize that you're the leading man, and you ain't going to get to the window to feed the bird. And if people came late to the play, it would look like Esther Williams about to go into the water. Then the director said, hang your... See, this happened. At... Hang your hat on a lower antler. Now, he's sweating, too. This see, it's not only me. Hang your hat on a lower antler? Yes. You see, this was a hunting lodge, as I said. Ah. And there were antlers. And I couldn't see because I, I, I didn't have my glasses on. And I used to hang my hat on a lower antler when mm -hmm. I could see. Because a leading man should see whenever possible. <laughs> so I thought, he said, hang it on the lower, lower antler, so they see the barometer, which was an important part in the, in the plot. Right, right. So I hung it on the lower antler, making sure I saw it. It's this being in the antler. Good. Mm -hmm. That's all imagery, which That's we right. do in art. Certainly. And as I go to find the lower antler, the upper antler catches the two pegs. <laughs> you see? But nobody knows it, because when a leading man is in trouble, a true leading man, nothing shows. That's right. You might sweat a little, you might, your feet might be together. And I was right hanging on that antler with my feet clamped, wondering why this play is only going to last four nights. <laughs> and I realized then that Rex Harrison is probably safe. <laughs> Burt Reynolds is safe. <laughs> Not your metier, huh? No, I, I, are they, are we going to go into commercial now because yeah, you're getting so. up? I think so. I just want to say I'm so glad that you're back for three more years because I love well, you. <laughs> no, but, yeah.
And I'll tell you why later. But you've got enough stories for three years. We'll be right back. Nope, I'll just tell you my story. <laughs> Yeah, we're talking to stars after that. Tom tonight. That is one of the funniest pictures, mental pictures I've seen. The leading man with his spurs entangled, oh, hanging yourself on the But in the theater, you get away with that. But well, on television, you can, or the screen, because the camera's right there. Oh, that's right. But on the stage, you You're can, you can wear a dirty noticed. shirt, and for the third row, it looks immaculate, martinizing. Oh, you know what I mean? Sure. Were there any, any other uh, terrible things that happened during this run? That, that's just about enough. No, that's not so bad. I had yeah. the funny thing, my, uh, do I have time for a story, Quickie? Yeah. You're very sweet. Uh, <laughs> my friend takes care of my house when I go away. See, that's the other thing. It's very hard to be in New York, like Victor coming out. You're in New York, and then right. you're in California, and you don't know where your spoons are. You don't know where the scissors are. You hire a professional house sitter? They well, no, no, my, my, I have a business partner. I have two business partners. We had three businesses. They all went under. Oh. They didn't go under, they're, stu they're still there, but we never went to the office. Oh, I see. You know what, we had three offices, beautiful, we had the plants decorated, everything was gorgeous, but we didn't want to go to the office. We made a lot of money, we had things brought to Broadway, London, right. PBS, but we never went to the office. We'd go, let's go to lunch at 11 to 4, and it was terrific, who wants to sit in an office? So we would have a, a recorder saying all lines to the commercial clinic are now uh, uh, unavailable, you know, we were all eating. Right. But anyway, my friend, my friend, <coughs> this is... The result of the, uh... No, my friend is one of these. He's terrific. He lives in Napa. Mm -hmm. and, and he has a ranch. He, he takes care of my house. And he will say to me, after he sees me for three days, did I tell you the car is totaled? I didn't tell you, did I? I said, no. He's one of those that oh. you don't hear right away. Mm -hmm. Then if you're in the den or something, you move and you get a message from four weeks ago. But he should have told me one thing. So to make a long story short, I had two house guests when I just came back from New York, an opera singer and her husband, my friend. Mm -hmm. And they came out for two weeks, and then they left. The morning they left, this is true, I come back in the house, and I'm in the hall, and I look in the hall, and there's an alligator in the hall. It sounds I just, like a James Thurber thing, an alligator in the hall? No, it's an alligator. You know, Ron Eli could be in the other room any minute, but I mean, there was an alligator in the hall. What size alligator? Two and a half feet. <coughs> and about six inches high. Now, if you look at it, you say, in a play, oh, there's an alligator in the hall. But in real life, you just go, there's an alligator in the hall. <laughs> now, <laughs> although I'm a leading man and play these parts, in the house, I'm not that leading man. I see. I'm rather like a screaming ninny, and there's an alligator in the hall. Now, there are four rooms off the hall. <coughs> I'll be all right. Yes, that's all right. There are four rooms off the hall. And I figure I got to watch this alligator to see which room it's going to go into, because I don't care about the alligator, what's it going to do to me, but I want to know where the thing is. I don't mean to interrupt the story. You go ahead, because this is a true story. I have, I have pictures to verify. Did it occur to you when you saw it? Where it came no. from? No. You just assumed no. that there was an alligator there and then dealt with it? Yes, Your Honor. Ah. There was no way that I knew where this came from. It came from the bathroom. It walked out. Walking on the shellac floor going, where's a rock, where's a lily pad? I don't know if I'm not this nuts about Beverly Hills. So it's walking out, and I just had to know where it went. So I had to watch it. And I didn't want So first I thought I'd talk to it. The head was very big. The eyes looked nice. Very pretty yellow and green. I said, do you want to go out? You know, I figured, what the hell? It's always a good opening question. No, you want to go? Right. And it walked a little, it didn't, and it couldn't walk so good, because it hadn't eaten, I found out, for two weeks. It was hiding in the den for two weeks. See, this guy didn't tell me, the friend that takes care of my house that never tells me. His friend came from Napa with a big cardboard box. The alligator. When I was in New York with my, with my hair caught on the antler and my right. feet stuck together, <laughs> And said to, the, to my friend, you want to see my prize in the big cardboard box? And then when they went to the cardboard box, it wasn't there. See? Uh, That's the, the source of the alligator. I see. So for four hours, I try to get this alligator. The guy that delivers the bottle of water came to the door and says, what are you doing? I couldn't take my eyes off because I just wanted to know where it was going to go. <laughs> I said, I'm with my alligator. I mean, what does anybody do in the afternoon here? So he came and I said, yes, I've had it for years. It's just adorable, isn't it? But the thing about it is you really get into hunting when you have this alligator. I mean, you suddenly, four hours, and then I lost the light. It got dark. It was about 6 o'clock. 
like in the jungle. You yes. know, what do you do when you lose the light, a hunter? You know what I'm saying? Yes, I know what you So saying. I finally took a laundry basket. I have a dog, Mona. Now, my dogs are imbecile. What else? My dog is an imbecile, and it'll be out in the thing looking for a lizard. And then three feet away on the wall, the lizard is going... <laughs> <laughs> this dog is not, shouldn't be outdoors. Right. So I finally get the door open, and I say, Mona, scare it toward the door. Get it. This alligator. Yes. Yeah. Mona walks by the thing three times, doesn't even see it. <laughs> Hunting is not her middle name. <laughs> Spurs is not right. mine. You no. know what I'm saying? But I finally got a laundry basket and got it out. The next night, I'm getting into bed to watch TV. I see something in this corner of my eye. It's a very big spider on the wall. A big one. You're talking... I'm talking spider... <laughs> Bill, a billiard cube size with legs, with a lot of hair, weaving something you could hang clothes on with a clothes. <laughs> I'm talking about. You're talking I got bad eyes. About your basic talking. big spider. So I thought, well, it's back to the hunt again. Get my laundry basket. <laughs> was this another? Was this another pet of uh, your friend? Yes, it was in the box. And I said, did you didn't forget to tell me about the spider? He thought the alligator had ate the spider. I said, no. But the chopper to this before I go off is I have come home to find a word I can't say because I was born in the Bronx, roaches. I have a lot of roaches. Bronx is one. I w have roaches now in my house. So I bought, now that I'm in hunting with the spiders and sure. the alligators. Yeah. You're, you know, hard enough. I'm ready for anything. Right. I get what they advertise on TV. My pupil does the advertising because I'm partial to that. Yes. A lovely girl. The Roach Motel. Or where they go in and... Now, now what does it say? Now, wait. They check, what is check it? Check in, but never, never check, check out. out. Right. Now, I thought this is good because I had them all over. I mean, I make a salad and three would come and go, ooh, let's put, don't put the anchovies in. I said, I don't need this because it's Beverly Hills. They're all... I've been away a few months. So I get these adorable, they check in but don't check out Aunt Motels. I put them all around the house. Then, of course, I have to have a notebook and go around and check, see what I get each day. You know, how did the one Jew next to the sugar? Right. Is the one in the dish closet doing good? Now, there's no odor, there's no insecticide, there's just a lot of glue. So these poor things go in and are stuck city. <laughs> they are stuck. <laughs> they are stuck. And I talk to them every day, they're still alive and they're going, they're, they're going, oh yeah, they're going, this is not a disco. <laughs> I didn't know that about the Rose Hotel. We'll be right back I with Pete Barboon. <laughs> Pete Barbooty is here tonight, and Pete is, uh... Pete is slightly deranged, which is good, because bizarre comedy comes from slightly deranged people. And on uh, May 26th, he's going to be starting a one-week engagement at the Sahara Hotel in uh, Lake Tahoe. And on June uh, 2nd, he'll be opening the Sahara in Reno. And he's just finished taping, I understand, his own television series called Pete's Place. Oh, Yes. Yeah, what a catchy title. Which will be airing this fall. Would you welcome Pete Barbuti? <laughs> Thank you. I like the microphone stand a little off center. Well, uh, I brung the old horn out here tonight, and uh, I know when you see this, uh, right away you say to yourself, boy, I bet that horn's got a million stories in it, huh? <laughs> well, the trumpet player tells a story every time he plays his horn. Once upon a time... Now, I gotta tell you, there is kind of a story behind this, and it's kind of uh, interesting. I was, as a young kid, I used to hang out at some of the great jazz places down in New Orleans, and boy, that's where it all started. And I guess most of the guys got their start there. He used to hide in the kitchen, as I guess so many young aspiring musicians did. And, and of all the musicians in the band, the trumpet player, boy, they used to really get me excited. And, and, one, and one day I was back in the kitchen looking out there through the crack. I was just a little. Oh, boy, at the time, and 
gee whiz, this band was playing. It was after hours. I shouldn't even have been there. They were playing real good. And, and this trumpet player came in. He took out this beautiful shiny horn, and he got up and he played. And Well, I mean, he knew the horn good, see, but he didn't have the feeling. He didn't have the soul down in there. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll be like him. And then I was about an hour later, another guy came in. And, boy, he played real good, too, but he still didn't have that soul I wanted, you know. And, and then it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, this real old man came in. White-haired old man kind of stooped over. And boy, he was way up there in years. And, and he had a paper bag. He didn't have a fancy case or anything. And he took this horn out of it. And I'll never forget this, ladies and gentlemen. He put that horn up to his lips, and he stunk. And this guy really stunk. He didn't play one right note. So I waited for him in the parking lot. And I beat the hell out of that old man. That's right. Music's your life, isn't it? Oh, I swear to God. You want me to be careful of that? Yeah. I, I know that's priceless. A lot of money tied up you in that betcha. stuff. You know? <laughs> we'll, take, uh, we'll take just a short intermission here, and we'll be back to Music City. <laughs> We're back talking with Pete Barbudi, Charles Nelson Riley, Tom Brokaw will join us in a few moments. You know, I was just thinking, I, I, I'm a cigarette smoker. Yeah. Not particularly good. You get on an airline and they'll allow you to smoke in a smoking section, but they always say no pipes and no cigars. Or cigars Jump on the right plane. on you. God, it's that... a problem smoking cigars because most women hate them. Am I right, girls? I like the aroma. I like the aroma. Of yeah, well, some people do, some I do not. They, uh, I think that's when a woman can be her most vicious. When, really? When, like, you, somebody at work would give you, you know, an office worker, give you a three, four, five dollar Havana job and you. Smuggle it by her somehow into the living room and a little Monday night football and yes. sitting back in your chair, you know, kind of a king in your castle. And here she comes out of the kitchen with that look in her eye. Huh? Get that out of here! <laughs> she grab it. Now, 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 this is really evil. She grab it out of your mouth, break it in half, rendering it unsmokable forever. <laughs> it does not then get thrown into the garbage, never to be seen again. It gets thrown out on the lawn right next to the walk where you have to see it every day, but you can't ever smoke it again. And then it rains on it and it discolors, and the sun beats on it, it loses its shape. And then finally you're coming home from work one Friday, and the crowning blow, there's a bug crawling across your cigar. So you run over and stomp out his life. Get off my cigar! <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not my cigar. <laughs> Yeah, you know. Cigars get expensive, don't they? I mean, oh, it's staggering. I just came back from Toronto and uh, cigar. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very nice of you. Charles just got back from New York. Yeah. Take much to turn him on, doesn't? Top towns are in. Yeah. <laughs> you was that where you were taping the show? Toronto? Yeah. yeah. Havana cigars are now. Can't say the brand name, can I? I thought no. Oh, well, the standard... I didn't know you could get Havanas, aren't you they? You can't hear, but in yeah. Canada, they're ah, legal because they still recognize the trade agreement with uh, Havana. Because of the blight on the tobacco crop, it, it, it now costs, you ready for this? A cigar this size now costs $8.10 a piece. Are you serious? Yeah. $8.10 a piece. It's, it will be cheaper to buy dope, they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> They tell me. Yeah, I don't know anything. How many? They say Winston Churchill would use to 20 of those a day. Yeah, sure. Melton Burr, a lot of those people smoke. Uh, George Burns. George Burns. Of course, George smokes cheap ones, though. He confided in me. Red Skelton, I know, is a big cigar. Yeah, Red around. smokes good cigars. But if you smoke 20 a day at $8 a piece. Then... That's a very expensive habit. Yes. I don't Do you know have that. your own special humidor? Some of the people have, but they go to the, the, you know, the tobacco shops. They have a special case and special Keep them in humidor. the shower, John. That seems to do it. <laughs> you hang it from a plastic bag from the shower thing. Put them in there. They don't get wet, but they stay nice and moist. Oh, I never thought then, of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you don't smoke cigars. Yeah, you right. wouldn't think of that. No. I think of that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> As little else I think about. That's right. Kill better part of the day, I suppose, yes, thinking yes, about that. thinking where am I? Ah, we'll, uh, we'll do this, and then we're going to return Maybe here. we will. Sure. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Uh, 
I'm sure you all know my next guest. He comes from the same part of the country. He's Midwestern. Thomas from South Dakota. And he started his uh, career as a journalist in college. And now he could be seen, as you know, every weekday hosting NBC's Today Show. And on top of that, fellas, thought you're a leading man, huh? He's just been named by Playgirl magazine as one of America's ten sexiest men. Here's Tom Brokaw. Not a good year for sex appeal. <laughs> Hi, sexy. I felt real good about that until I discovered that I finished just ahead of Tommy Newsom and Irving R. Levine. Tommy Newsom? It didn't seem like a big deal. Irving R. Levine with a bow tie. Right. Are you getting kidded now by your colleagues in the news department? Lots of that. Uh, they've yeah. taken the old Henry Kissinger poster with the lumpy body, put my face over it, and it says it's a dead ringer. We can see how you made it. Well, congratulations. Thank For what, you. whatever it's, it's worth, anyway. It's a moment of high hysteria among my daughters. They find it extremely oh, hard to work. God, that must be... They'll be hearing about that soon. around looking at me, laughing a little yeah. Let me ask you, I mentioned you're, you're from South Dakota, right? Indeed. Where about South Dakota originally? Was it... Well, I ended up growing up in Yankton, which is 40 miles up the road from Norfolk. W, yeah, no, I grew up in Norfolk, Nebraska. Right. All I remember from Yankton is, see if I can remember the time, WNAX? WNAX, the Midwest address of CBS. Yeah. 570 on your dial. Didn't you used to do it this way, though, in the booth? Oh, we did it that way, right. Announcers always used to sit in the announce booth saying this W-O-W Omaha, because you'd get that reverberation, it like talking in a shower. Lawrence Welk worked there, as a matter of fact. Lawrence Welk's remember. band used to come out of Yankton, House South band. Dakota, and play all over the Midwest. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a few years ahead of you, though. You, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and I may say a dollar or two ahead of me as well. Ah, well, well I, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, who'd your first job pay in the radio station? I can still remember. There are oh. things in your life you always remember for some reason. It's like what you paid for your uh, wedding ring. It's like uh, what you paid for your first apartment. And everybody remembers what they got in their very first so-called professional job. I got $47.50 a week. I got a dollar an hour, which worked out about to that. Yeah. Minimum wage in those days, a buck an hour. And you thought you were doing quite well. Oh, I loved it. You know, I thought the whole world was listening. But on a good night in Yankton, it was a coyote passing through town, the entire audience, you know. Not, not a biggie, huh? No, but it was great fun. Um, you worked in a radio station. Um, didn't you go back? Somebody told me you went back and they had a day for you, or, uh... I had an honorary degree from the University of South Dakota. Very recently, my alma mater. Was that now the Humane Letters, or, uh... Humane Letters, indeed. And as a matter of fact, there were many of my professors who thought when I was undergraduate that they'd have to give me an honorary degree to get me out of there yeah. at that time. So it was, it was great. Actually, I go back as a kind of reminder to those who do not graduate with honors that it can work out all right anyway. I did the same thing. I went back to Norfolk High School in 1976. They invited me back to give the graduation uh, commencement address. And I had more fun, and I've never been so nervous in my entire life. Because you would look out and you would see your teachers who taught you when you were a little child sitting there. Most of them were retired now. They were all sitting there in front. None of them at the time, you know, was either jail or, you know, the loony bin is where you're going to go. Because a lot of times, many people who were success in show business were not particularly good in school. <coughs> No greater authority figures in our lives than those teachers. Yeah. They still hold it over us. They know things about us that we don't want anyone else yeah. to know. In those days. So you went back to... Uh, I South went Dakota? back and I explained... Uh, I was uh, Actually, I was greatly honored. The yeah. University of South Dakota, I have a political science degree, and I had pretty good marks in political science, but I explained to the graduating class that my grade point average wasn't all that everyone would like it to be, but there was always a rational explanation. I, told, I gave the commencement address as well, and I said, actually, they determine my grades here on a case-by-case -case basis. First a case of Coors, then a case of Budweiser. <laughs> Got you on. I had a good time. You had a very good time. When did, when did you move out of the Midwest? Did you I moved out of there in 1962 and went on to Omaha, first job. Right. You know, uh, we have certain parallels in our right. career. And then uh, went on to Atlanta. And then came here to Los Angeles, right. and I was here about a year before you moved out here from New York, as That's I recall. Right. Now, the people who worked at Today Show work a very strange schedule. Yes. And I'd, I used to, uh, as we all did who work radio, had from time to time the early morning shift where you'd open the station at 5 o'clock and you'd work for five or six hours. But you've been doing this now for how many years? For four years, going on 40 at this time. It's, yeah. a, it's a long, hard day. I'm 
As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I'm grateful to appear on this program, it gives me a chance to stay up with the grown-ups. Isn't it nice? It's nice, yeah. I, I what time do you normally have to go to bed? I remember if I was back there and I would talk to some of the people when, when Barbara was doing the, the, the early morning show. About 9 o'clock or 10, she would say, I really have to, to split because you get up at what, about 4.15? Or... I get up at 4.15. A lot of people say, well, what time do you get up? And I say 4.15, and they look at me and say, well, that's not so bad. I say, leave your phone number. I'll call you tomorrow morning. Yeah. You know, see how you feel at 4.15 in the morning. Now, what's happening in New York at 4.15 in the morning? How do you... That's got to be a strange feeling. It is a, it is a peculiar time of the day, and there was a time in my life when I would go to get up with that, or be in Omaha, in, in New York, driving down Fifth Avenue, and those concrete benches are there, and sure. they're often in the early morning or late hours, you've seen them, guys wrapped up in the newspapers, they've had a little bad luck in life. Yes. Some former NBC vice president <laughs> <laughs> find themselves there, and you feel a moment of compassion and pity for them. Now I drive by them at 4.45 in the morning, and I look out on them and I feel no compassion or pity. I feel envy for the yes. extra hour of sleep that they're getting. They're still sleeping in. I'm on my way to work. You know, it's uh, it's can hard. You, how I... could you manage to get any energy level at that time of day? Uh, I remember coming into the radio station and just being usually in kind of a stupor and having to read the news, which you would usually tear off the teletype and not even bother to read and just sit down and say, and start to, to read it. And it would, <coughs> would take me an hour or so before I really started to, to come awake. One thing that helps is that given the news of this day and these days, yeah. get your heart started right away. Yeah. I mean, they call me at 1.30 in the morning and said, we've had an Iranian rescue mission that failed. Eight people are dead in the desert sands. That tends to wake you right up, uh, sit bold up right. That's right, because you've got to cover that immediately. Right. Right. We went on, mission. in fact, a half hour early that day and uh, stayed on with it. So Do you come in? I imagine they, uh, when you heard that at that time of the morning, you stay up and just... Yeah, I, I go in early and go in and work in the newsroom and put together the first of the newscasts. And we've done a lot of the preparation the day before. And, but we always have to be ready and flexible to, to yeah. make a move at any time because if the news breaks, then we've got to go with it. Now, I know the Today Show has been kind enough to invite me when I've been back to come and do the Today We're Show. We're still eager to have but you. But I cannot really function. And when I say, what time do I have to be there? And they say, how about 7 o'clock? <coughs> well, that, that's, we'll, ten, we'll send I two really attendants to hold going. you up. They'll, they'll I bring really you right can't there. function that well. No, it's hard. A lot of people have a hard time. We, they come on the program and it's something... I was going to ask you, how about an interview? Yeah. You see, you see people who are the larks, obviously, and they get up and they're chirpy and they're happy to be there. And then you see the people who cannot believe what someone has done to them, drag them in there. And so, most of them work out fairly well. I've had some people, on the other hand, as you've had on this program, who get there and suddenly realize that they can't cope, whatever the hour is. My favorite interview, I was telling someone on your staff earlier that my favorite interview, we had an Italian film director who discovered the fifth face at Mount Rushmore. Remember the shadow? And they now see the shadow when they take the photograph. He came on with the film of that. And I'd been told before. That sounds pretty fascinating. Well, I'd have been told that he was, this guy was wonderful and we sat down together and I'd worked a lot of preparation and he was an Italian filmmaker, not to worry about anything. And something went wrong with him. He was scared to death. He was on American television. And I asked him the first question, and he answered me fluently, but in Italian, unfortunately. <laughs> I knew we had a problem. That's the right first there. problem. That's a problem. So I thought I'd give him one small second question. It was a little test, and it came right back in Italian. Did you ever, could you ever get him off track? What I did was say grazie and conduct the entire interview by asking the questions and then answering them for him. And he would say, see, sí, and sit there with me the whole time. And I'd say, isn't it true that when you were there with your film crew? Oh, I see. If that's why the answer. What you do is supply the answer. They see there are other moments that you'd like to do that as well. Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So now, a lot of public officials watch the, the Today Show. Because yes. as you say, you're, you're the first you're on in the morning. And it's almost like reading the daily paper. They watch that because you do a lot of interviews with, with, with the current things. Do a... Do you have a lot of problem with equal time things when you have somebody on? Is that kind of a... We have a problem with something called the fairness doctrine. That's equal... what I meant. Not yeah, the, the, there are, people don't understand the difference, but the, you get caught up in the equal time thing. We get caught up in the fairness doctrine because we're a news program. You're an entertainment program. Right. So we have to make, in a, on a balanced fashion, a fair presentation of what's going on. I and they have our telephone number. And sometimes you get that call. <coughs> we call it in our business a rocket. You get a rocket from uh, yeah. the White House. In other example. words, if somebody's coming on and is pro-nuclear and there's right. a long extended thing, right away you're going to hear from the anti-people under the fairness doctrine. Two o'clock in the morning, I've gotten calls from the various campaigns, from their people saying, we just heard at the end of this program, your program, tomorrow morning on the Today Show that you're going to have somebody on from the White House. How come we don't have our guy on? So there's a, it's yeah. a real tough marketplace, for one thing, and people are constantly competing for it. And gratefully, our program is a place where a lot of people want yeah. to appear because it's an important thing. Uh, and so you hear from everyone. Do you think p politicians sometimes save things, like they do for newspapers? I, I know politicians very often 
will not want things to break on a Friday afternoon mm -hmm. because they don't make the, the, the Sunday papers. Right. They, will, they will hold it off and make the announcement on a, a Monday or a Wednesday or something so it gets good coverage. Do you think people sometimes come on a show like the Today Show and use that? Yeah. Because I know they do on Meet the Press and other yeah. shows. No, occasionally they will. Yeah. Um, you know, people always, in the Iranian situation, they've talked about being used, but we're constantly used in a matter of speaking. I yeah. mean, people are floating trial balloons. They want to try something out in the morning and see what happens, and by mid-afternoon, they can see how the reaction is going to it. Yeah. Our bigger problem is when people come on and don't have anything to say. That, that's uh, more of a worry yes. for us. That seldom to... happens with a politician. You can always count on filling in the space. At least. Oh, they know. They're going to say right. so. yeah, Politicians have a way of keep talking until they think of something to say. <laughs> you know, and they just... That's right. Well, look, take a break. We'll be right back. And we'll have something to say. Hello there. We're back. You know, it seems to be, uh, I think mainly because of television, there's been a tremendous revival in news and what's going on because it's immediate and people can see. Do you get an indication on the show? I do from here even from the audience when I do stuff in the monologues, politically. We all watch it. About this, about what the country is feeling and how they feel about certain things, the way they react, whether they're pro-something or anti a particular candidate, and you get a pretty good cross-section right. of, of view. Do, do you feel that also? Yeah, we've been out polling a lot uh, for the Today program, going doing what we call the mood of whatever the primary yeah. state happens to be. A, a young producer, Mark Kuznets, and I've been going all over the country talking to people, and we find there's a common thread the common thread is that they're fed up and they don't have any idea who they want in office this fall and they don't believe it'll make any difference who it is. That's I mean, kind of sad, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. There's a lot of fear and a lot of concern. Don't you people in, uh, uh, don't you people in the news feel that also that the, the contest is going to be over in a couple of weeks by, say, June 5th or 6th and all of the suspense yeah is going to be gone. Well, you know, 90% of it has been uh, drained from it already because yeah. it does look like it's going to be Carter and Reagan, although that can change. There's no question about it. But it, it appears it'll be that way. There was a, a New York Times poll recently in which they asked people, given that possibility, right. they said, uh, would you be happy with the choice? Half the people said they would not be happy with the choice of Reagan or Carter. So I asked Art Buckwald, I said, does that on the air, I said, does that bother you that half the people said that they're not happy with the choice between Carter and Reagan. Buckwald said, no, what bothers me is the half that is happy with the choice between <laughs> Carter and Reagan. Well, okay, I want to get Victor out here. He's a friend we have not seen for a while. He's a fine actor. He's also a writer and a poet. Comes up with very original things. And he is one of the stars in a television movie called Murder Can Hurt You, <laughs> which will be shown tomorrow, May 21st, from 9 to 11 p.m. Would you welcome Victor Buono. Victor. Thank you. I want to talk to you about a subject which is very close to Johnny's heart. That subject is the yak. <laughs> this, this is a yak. The word yak comes from the Tibetan word yak, <laughs> which means yak. <laughs> now, according to the dictionary, a yak is a large wild ox of Tibet and adjacent elevated parts of Central Asia having short, smooth hair in the back long, wavy hair on the sides, being up to six feet in height, 1,200 pounds in weight, and living as a beast of burden and a source of milk, flesh, hide, and hair, and how many of us can say that much about ourselves? <laughs> the yak is intimately related to every aspect of life in Central Asia. In music, they have such favorites as that old yak magic. <laughs> I've grown accustomed to her yak. You light up my yak. You yak up my life. In art... 
I am trying to be serious. <laughs> in art, there is Mona Yak and the Yak de Milo. In politics, there's the embarrassing missing 18 and a half minute Yak. In science, there are Yak holes in space. And food, food they have such delicacies over there as yakaroni, yakamoli, teriyaki, chicken fricka yak, and yak fricka chicken. And of course, yak in the box. <clears throat> in literature, theater, and films, they they love such classic tales as the Hunch Yak of Notre Dame, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> Yakka Blanca, <laughs> Dr. Yackle, Mr. Hyde, and more recently, the Yak Stallion. And yet, despite this, very little has been written outside of Central Asia about this profoundly influential animal, despite the fact that Yak are directly responsible for over 17,400 words and phrases in daily use throughout Asia. Such common expressions as colder than a well digger's yak. You hear that all the time. <laughs> Built like a brick yak. You might have heard that at the UN. As nervous as a yak in church. A watched yak never potties. That is not used all that much. And such words might not be, I will explain a few of the words, a hypochondriac. That's a yak herder who fears he has caught something from his yak. Uh, dipsomaniac. That's a yakaholic. The Pontiac. A popular Tibetan automobile featuring the five-door yak back. See also cattle yak. An insomniac is a yak in need of valium. Yak knife. Two definitions. One, a cutting instrument having short, smooth blades on the top and long, wavy blades on the sides. And another definition of the word yak knife is a dive in which the diver keeps his back legs straight and touches his front feet to his back feet just before plunging into a snowbank. Yakula. Remember Yakula. Classic Tibetan novel about vampirism. See also Yankenstein and Weir Yaks. The traveling salesman and the farmer's yak. It's a disgusting Central Asian joke. <laughs> Curb your yak. This is a common street sign in Tibet. Mouth to yak resuscitation. Luckily, it is a rarely employed, seldom justifiable procedure in Tibetan veterinary medicine punishable by a fine and or imprisonment. Moby Yak, the classic tale about a peg-legged albino yak obsessed with killing Gregory Peck. <laughs> yak the Ripper, the homicidal mani yak. Then there's Koyak, it's a popular Tibetan television show about a bald Greek yak hooked on lollipops. <laughs> Remember Plymouth Yak? That's the hallowed site of the first colony in Tibet where starving pilgrims were kept alive through that hard winter by friendly yak who brought them Indians to eat. <laughs> Deep Yak. It's a revolting Central Asian pornographic film. See also Last Yak in Paris. X Yaks. That's a mild Tibetan yaksative. Yakni. That's an embarrassing skin condition prevalent among frustrated adolescent yak. Yaks Fifth Avenue. That's a fashionable Tibetan store featuring Gucci plows. A yak breaker is a dangerously heavy load. See also Yak Ache and hernia yak. <laughs> Belly yak. Abdominal discomfort caused by eating tainted yak. Yakectomy. This is the surgical removal of a ruptured, impacted, infected, inflamed, or otherwise malfunctioning yak. See also cardiac, yakupuncture, and open yak surgery. <laughs> There's pyromaniac. Those are demented yak who periodically set fire to one another. And the yak rabbit. This is a promiscuous yak with long upright ears, 
See also Nymphomaniac, Yakking Up, Yakamoni, Yak versus Marvin, and Vasector Yak.